Welcome to Foresight Friday Roundup, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Berta, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Friday, April 23rd. On our March 26th episode, uh, just four weeks ago, we looked at four big healthcare deals and why we thought they foreshadowed the future of healthcare. What we didn't realize was that the future would get here in less than a month. On today's episode of the Roundup, we're going to talk about six more big deals that would suggest that we might know what we're talking about. So we're going to discuss what the following companies did over the past few weeks and why what they did is important or at least something to watch. Oscar Health launching a new technology platform. The Mayo Clinic launching a new technology platform. Microsoft buying Nuance to create a new technology platform. Google building a new health record platform. The Cleveland Clinic partnering with IBM to build a new technology platform. And Christiana Care partnering with the Highmark Blues plan to build a value-based care platform. To explain what's going on and why are Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Merchantson, partner at Transformation Capital. Hey, Dave. Hey, Julie. How are you guys doing this morning, Dave? Just fine. I'm enjoying coffee and thinking about what a great gift to humanity it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, here, here. Julie, how about you? Well, the sun's been shining here in California. It's been nice and toasty warm, and it feels like we've had a good dose of justice this week. So things are good. Yeah, coffee, sunshine, and justice, right? (laughs) Now, before we talk about the latest round of big deals, I did want to ask you both about some big deals in your lives, and that's the fact that you both traveled for the first time in a long time, thanks to the pandemic. Dave, uh, what did you do? How would you assess your COVID risk, and how would you assess your travel skills after not traveling for a year? Well, I'm definitely rusty. What did Yogi Berra say? It's like deja vu all over again, you know, packing a bag, driving to O'Hare, hanging out in the Admiral's Club, getting an Uber, road food. The only new thing is is wiping down seats <laughs> when you get on the plane. Anyway, I went to Kiowa, South Carolina early this week. Beautiful place if you haven't been there to do some advisory work and give a speech on the virus vaccine and victory. The sponsors very nicely gave me a commemorative bottle of wine for the event, which I promptly put in my carry-on bag without a second thought (laughs) and uh, surrendered it at security when it got called over. You know, that three-ounce rule still applies. So there you go. (laughs) That's that's great. Too bad for you. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Julie, same thing. What was your uh, first COVID adventure? Uh, Did you retain your travel skills and did you feel safe? (laughs) <laughs> it's funny that you just said that, Dave, because when we sent our son back to school, I put all of his full-size shampoo and conditioner in his rolly bag that he took on the plane. So we had the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I went to Hawaii, which to me felt like an uber-safe place given the testing they do to even get on those islands. But I had my mask and sanitizer and wipes and gloves, and I double-masked. And, you know, United gives you a wipe when you get on board. And it, it feels like everyone's being conscious, that's for sure. But I was probably looking a little bit of conservative. Okay, good, good. Well, you made it back in one piece. That's great. Now, I I didn't travel, but I did eat at a restaurant for the first time in more than a year. My wife and I ate outside the restaurant in a tent, and we were the only people in the tent for at least half the time we were there. You know, we followed all the protocols, and we felt pretty safe. And rest assured, I did not lose my ability to order food or pick up the check. So... (laughs) All right, let's talk about all these deals that happened over the past few weeks. Dave, tell us which ones you think move the needle and why. Data, data, data. What are we going to do with all this data? The hits just keep on coming. You know, in addition to the six deals that you mentioned, Dave, there have been several other recently announced transactions. Uh, The launch of the Advocate Aurora Enterprises and their first two investments, acquiring senior helpers, a nationwide home and personal care company, and leading an investment round for FoodSmart, a nutrition services company, Cleveland Clinic's partnership with Amwell to provide virtual second opinions, Bright's acquisition of Zipnosis, uh, Truveta and Graphite, two provider-led initiatives to manage clinical data. You know, I could go on. 
part of this activity is is cloud wars. The big tech companies applying cloud computing and analytics to clinical claims and personal health data that's locked up in fragmented legacy IT systems with the hope and intent of providing earlier disease detection and more accurate diagnosis, leading obviously to better and hopefully better outcomes. Microsoft, Google, and IBM feature prominently in your transaction list. They're adding capabilities and finding dance partners. You know, it's remarkable how big these big tech companies have begun. It was less than three years ago that the world looked on in awe as Apple passed $1 trillion in market capitalization. Today, Apple's market cap is two and a quarter trillion. So it's more than doubled in three years. Microsoft's market cap rounds up to two trillion. At that level, a $16 billion price tag for nuance, which seems pretty steep, is a virtual drop in the bucket. So big tech is coming into healthcare in a big way. Some of these transactions focus on improved consumer and member experiences uh, using virtual and digital capabilities. Others focus on improving care delivery efficiency. Others focus on more continuous consumer and patient engagement to provide enhanced chronic disease management and promote wellness and well-being. Big picture, traditional payer and provider companies are being squeezed from both sides. Uh, Nimble upstart companies like Oscar that attack targeted areas without the burden of legacy costs and culture. And then massive, well-capitalized companies that can buy their way into value-based care delivery almost without limitation. Think big tech and Optum. This is the market's way of reallocating resources to transform America's broken healthcare system. The good news for consumers and the American economy is bad news for entrenched healthcare incumbents clinging to legacy fee-for-service business models. Like the carpenters sang, we've only just begun. (laughs) Thanks, Dave. Julie, uh, which one of those deals had your spidey senses tingling and why? Well, Dave, two of these deals are a bit of deja vu. First, IBM and Cleveland Clinic sounds fantastic. And it's completely in alignment with market interest in using digital technology and AI to accelerate scientific discovery. You know, life science companies are leaving the last decade of digital promotion, which has been mostly marketing oriented behind and beginning a new phase of digital transformation. So it looks like they're looking at how digital can help them do their work and not just how it helps them interact with their customers. That said, the overuse of the phrase quantum computing in some of the announcements around this deal, it smells a lot like the branding that IBM used with AI and Watson. And Watson also partnered with health systems to do some of their initial kind of exploratory work. And that ultimately fell apart. So my hope is that Cleveland Clinic and IBM create a really right partnership around this quantum computing and really do something good because we need it for a scientific discovery, that's for sure. Similarly, this is Google's second at bat with the PHR, as we've talked about, the first being in 2008. And fortunately, the world of data and digital health has progressed so much in the last 15 years. We have so much more data, as Dave talked about. And in 2008, we were barely getting started with EHR pipes. We hadn't really adopted much of anything by then. So I think Google's been smart to wait for data and smart to wait for these interoperability rules to play out because now the business incentives are starting to come together, although I would argue are not quite there yet. What concerns me is that there's just massive paranoia about privacy and Google's ability to dig deep into what motivates a person to do X, Y, Z for their health. Or perhaps more importantly, you know, if you look at what Google's trying to do to sit above EHRs, are they actually really digging deep enough into what motivates that provider to do X, Y, Z, to close a gap in care or take a certain step? So I just don't know that Google will think about it in as deep a way as they need to. I do have high hopes, though, because they have a lot of big brains around the table, and it seems fairly exploratory at this point. Got it. Thanks, Julie. Dave, anything to add to Julie's comments? Well, great observation about Watson and the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, They actually sent Watson to medical school at the Cleveland Clinic 
I guess it failed <laughs> or, or flunked out. <laughs> the The only thing I'd add relates to a piece that Infor's Matt Bragstead and I are doing comparing the roaring 1920s to what we will we believe will be the roaring 2020s. 1920s obviously came right on the heels of the pandemic and ended up being a remarkably creative period for industry and culture and arts and so on. When you think about healthcare today, we still largely operate like we did in the 1980s, uh, centered on hospital treatments, fee-for-service payment, doctors pretty much in charge of, of the process. That definitely won't be true by 2030. Healthcare will look very different, uh, be much more consumer focused, much more digitally enabled. Uh, We'll be finding disease states uh, very, very early through all the gnomes and, and the big data analytics. And I think most importantly, we'll go from a system today that spends 97% of its resources on treatment and only 3% on prevention to one that's much more balanced in keeping people healthy, happy, and and engaged. So buckle your seatbelts. Thanks, Dave. Now let's step back a bit and talk about what these deals have in common and what they say about the future of healthcare. Julie, what's the common thread and why is that thread significant? Well, you know, I have a good friend and former colleague, Seth Joseph, who led strategy for SureScripts and uh, now advises on platform models. And I think he would say that these are not all platforms, first of all. And Dave, I know you have a lot of thoughts on this, so I won't spoil <laughs> your perspective on this, but Seth thinks about platforms like Lyft and Airbnb that create value by allowing others to connect to create value in ways that are important to them and you know, perhaps more seamlessly. So I would just start with they're not all platforms. We have two potentially transformative announcements in Oscar and Mail, and I love those because they're bringing new functionality, new member engagement, new use of data, and new learnings. And frankly, I think we're going to see new regulatory posture around AI algorithms there, and that's huge. As Dave talked about these three announcements with Microsoft, Google, and IBM, you know, they're all competing in the cloud wars. And while this nuanced deal for Microsoft is the largest deal since Teladoc and Lavongo, it's really about the cloud wars. And Amazon and Google are pursuing both kind of the direct-to-consumer strategy and cloud, while it looks like Microsoft really prides itself in not disrupting in the way that Amazon and Google promise to do, but supporting transformation from within the enterprise through its cloud strategy. So it's all about the cloud. Lastly, you know, this Christiana Highmark deal, in some ways, there's definitely not much meat on the bones. It's sort of a traditional kind of payer provider joint venture approach, at least in the announcement that is. But it's the brainchild of three highly creative, empathetic, and business-minded women who see a path to a better future and are pulling their resources to make it happen. And a system like Christiana that has the market dominance that it does has the secret sauce to be able to really transform how it thinks about what healthcare is there. And with a partner like Highmark, they might just create something magical. So while it needs some substance, it feels like it's starting off on the right foot. Yeah, it's, they're using their market power for good, not evil. All right, Dave, I'm going to paraphrase Indigo Montoya here from The Princess Bride and say companies keep using the word platforming. Do you think it means what they think it means? And more importantly, uh, what does platforming mean from a market perspective and from a patient perspective? Funny you should ask about platforming. We've been asking ourselves which came first, platforms or exchanges. Part of what's fun about being a healthcare futurist is looking at how other industries have evolved and applying that knowledge to the disruption and reconfiguration of the healthcare industry. John Kaplan, uh, one of the leaders of BCG's healthcare practice, and I are doing exactly that for a commentary we're co-authoring on the Uberization of healthcare. My working title for the piece is Exchanges, platforms, and hybrids. Oh my, not sure John is there yet, so we'll see. But what are we talking about? Pure exchanges have existed for millennia. They bring buyers and sellers together to execute better transactions. Digital exchange companies like Uber do this through apps. So Uber doesn't own taxis or need rides. They connect drivers with passengers safely and securely through a seamless digital offering. 
In response, transportation companies are consolidating and offering their own digital apps. You know, every time you get in a traditional taxi cab, you, you see one of those offerings. These are examples, in our opinion, of, of platform companies. So companies that come together to respond to uh, exchange offerings. This phenomenon is even more evident in hospitality, where global hotel chains like Marriott and Hilton compete with digital exchange companies like Hotels.com to win customer business and loyalty. Marriott, Hilton, and other large chains are building massive platform companies that are easy to access offer more and more products and services that consumers want at competitive prices, as well as offering big perks, discounts, loyalty points, and so on. It's an expensive but necessary competitive response. There are not that many pure exchange companies in healthcare. One that I use as an example is Colonoscopy Assist, a a Texas-based company that you can go online, type in your zip code, and get GI procedures, so a colonoscopy for a fixed price. So they don't own the practices. They just connect GI practices that are willing to meet their standards and prices with consumers that need the services. But make no mistake about it, exchange companies are coming to healthcare in a big way. We talked about transparent in part one of our transactions podcast, like you mentioned at the beginning, Dave. Watch out for them and others like them. So In John's, in my opinion, as you think about exchanges and platforms and these seamless offerings that that connect capabilities and offer them up to consumers, traditional providers should adapt. And we're seeing a lot of that with companies like the Cleveland Clinic and Amwell offering digital second opinions. That's an example of a platforming capability built on the Cleveland Clinic's brands. But those, as I said earlier, that are clinging to traditional fee-for-service business models that don't build the competitive platforms as these exchanges and competing platforms offer consumers more and more choice should be afraid. They should be very afraid. Thanks, Dave. Julie, anything to add to Dave's comments? Well, I would just take it from a different direction. What we're seeing happening in earlier stage healthcare investment, certainly where Transformation and many other firms are investing, you're seeing a lot of small companies that truly have a product or they may be building a multi-product platform attempt to call themselves platforms. And what Dave just talked about in terms of businesses that can truly achieve kind of those network effects of what a platform business really is, you know, those businesses can achieve much higher valuations than your typical product or kind of multi-product platform. So I think this word platforming is about to become the new word like innovation was over the past couple of years. It's very overused and it's going to become more and more overused because it's all about money. Got it. Thanks, Julie. We'll see what the uh, future brings next week. Very well done. Now, as always on the Roundup, let's talk about next week. Julie, what is the big healthcare story next week? Well, I think this M&A machine is rolling. Um, There's another announcement even today. I also think, however, that we are seeing SPAC concerns, and they're starting to show through in a big way, and it's only April. So if you remember our SPAC podcast from a few months ago, we were talking about them fizzling out closer to the end of the year. So I think we're going to see a lot more, hear a lot more about the SPACs, of course, the next few weeks. Yeah, SPAC part two coming up. Dave, what's the big healthcare news everyone will be talking about next week? Well, Joe Biden is going to do a victory lap for his 100th day in office. And I expect we're going to hear a lot about the success of the vaccine rollout to date, but also a lot of encouragement for those that haven't gotten vaccinated yet to step up and do it. I'm also curious to see what the reaction is going to be to his fairly substantial proposal to increase individual and corporate tax rates by quite a bit (laughs) to pay for all this stuff that he wants to do. So I, I think we'll be talking about those things and healthcare will be a big part of that. Got it. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Julie. 
That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. You also can find a recording of this podcast and all our podcasts on the Healthcare Now Radio Network, iTunes, Spotify, and other streaming services. Subscribe now and don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Burda for Foresight Health.